On this edition of Native Report, we meet Fawn Sharp, the first woman president of the affiliated tribes of the Northwest Indians. We look through the camera lens of photographer Travis Novitsky. And we continue with part two of Barrel Whalers of the North. We also learn something new about Indian country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Malax Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandin Foundation. Hi, welcome to Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. Quinault Nation President Fawn Sharp is one of an emerging generation of leaders across Indian Country. Recently elected as the first woman president of the affiliated tribes of the Northwest Indians, I sat down with President Sharp at the National Congress of American Indians annual meeting. On this early morning before the general session at NCAI's annual convention, Quinault President Fawn Sharp tells us how she became involved in politics. I was elected in 2006 as uh, the president of the Quinault Indian Nation, and then I was re-elected to a second term in uh, March of 2009. Why did you enter politics? Uh, duty. Uh, it was a strong sense of duty. Uh, I had personal aspirations uh, following my career in law to continue uh, working uh, for fairness, equity, justice. And uh, when the elders approached me about running for tribal council, at first I, I said, I've been trained to seek truth, justice, and fairness in politics, tribal politics. It, it didn't quite jive with my personal uh, concept. But after uh, a few public debates, uh, an elder pulled me aside and said, look, fun, you're not running to be a politician, you're running to be a leader and a leader brings those virtues to office. Then I became more comfortable, so uh, I entered politics very reluctantly, but with a strong sense of duty. And then uh, I entered politics with a mindset that I didn't want to be a politician, I wanted to be a leader and, and it, it, you know, work with those virtues at the forefront of everything I do. I grew up in a family that was very dedicated to community service, uh, very dedicated to improving our community for the next generation. So I think I was very blessed to be born in, as many of our Native kids and youth were, uh, were providers and we serve uh, each other to ensure the well-being. So that was my blessing. I'm also newly elected the first woman president of uh, the affiliated tribes of the Northwest Indians. And we represent tribes in a seven state region. Uh, 58 tribes in Alaska, Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, Idaho, and Montana. The University of Washington hosts an annual Tribal Leaders Summit, and I was there, and uh, two leaders talked to me about running for the AT&I presidency, and I said, well, I'll have to give it some thought. I, I need to talk to my tribal council, and I clearly need the support of the council. So uh, that Monday, that was on a Saturday, Monday night, I put it on the agenda and had a unanimous support from our tribal council uh, and then ran just 10 days later. And I didn't know the election was that soon. I, I thought it was in February and it was only after I put it on the table with our tribal council. They said, Fawn, are we gonna have buttons? What are you gonna do for your campaign? And I said, we've got time for that. I'll, and they said, it's next week. <laughs> I said, next week. So it was very 10 days, 10 days. Uh, and I was initially, again, reluctant um, for that position because I thought I'm five years, I'm not that uh, experienced politically, and I'm still working at Quinault to uh, get organized, you know, organization and, and structure. And, uh, so how am I possibly going to leave tribes in a seven state region, 58 tribes, but an elder uh, told me that I need to recognize that others can see things uh, in me that I don't personally see. And I just need to have faith that uh, if other people recognize those qualities of leadership, I just need to trust that. And I believe we all have a, a path, that um, a calling. And as long as we're obedient to that calling and honoring our ancestors and, and hearing uh, the Creator in our, our path that we're supposed to take, that we'll be blessed in life. And so, 
Vaughn, a practicing attorney before her entry into politics, had been sick for several weeks the summer before the ATNI election. I was actually thinking of uh, going back to practicing law because my term is up in March and I thought uh, I love that professionalism and camaraderie in, in practicing law and, and this is just very difficult um, mentally, physically and emotionally to be in, in leadership but uh, out of that five week period I had a, a renewed commitment and my body healed, my mind healed and my spirit was renewed and uh, my mother suggested that maybe you know the creator took me to that place to reevaluate because uh, this next chapter was just around the corner. In my acceptance speech, I dedicated that moment to uh, the grandmothers and the mothers and the grand uh, granddaughters, and I made a vow then to uh, utilize the ATNI presidency in in every way possible to set that example for the young girls and, and the children. And I had an opportunity just recently to visit uh, the Shoban tribe, Shoshone Bannocks in Idaho, when I made a trip to the Head Start and. Uh, it just inspired me to see the, the little girls, and I met a princess there. Uh, I met uh, Shoban Royalty at the Head Start, and I, I just think that there may be that one meeting that a little girl might attend and see a, a woman tribal leader, and that may inspire her the rest of her life. And so I take this role as a very uh, sacred role uh, to serve as an example for the next generation, as well as to uh, honor uh, the elders. Uh, who've served probably a lifetime and to see a, a young leader, a woman a lead, uh, I want to honor them as well. At a young age, she aspired to be where she is today. One person she looked up to was the late Quinault president, Joe Delacruz. Who inspired me? Uh, Joe Delacruz, uh, he was a tribal leader that uh, I got to know at a very young age and it was a time when we were faced with many uh, court battles just to do the basic things that we've done for centuries, and that's fishing. And so at eight years old, I learned what the word treaty abrogation meant. And I, I knew that that meant that there were other people wanting to take away our right to just have a basic living that uh, my, my parents, my grandparents, and my great-grandparents did for, for years. I would love to see um, our people come together in, in unity. I just think there's so much within our tribal community, so much energy and so much collective passion that we can really move and advance a, a, an agenda in a number, of, a number of ways. It seems like everything that's valuable to us the outside world always finds a way to, to try to uh, eliminate or uh, make it difficult and challenging. But here we are, 68th year at the National Congress of American Indians. The words of advice she received from Wilma Mankiller is the same message she shares with the youth today. It was uh, within two months of my election in my first term, I had an occasion to, to have some time with Wilma and she told me, Fawn, you're going to have challenges uh, in your presidency. You're going to have people that are going to be opposing you, undermining you. Uh, you're going to have a lot of distractions. And she said, just recognize that those distractions are background noise. Uh, just turn the volume down and, and don't let it deter you from the direction you want to take. So that would be my message to the youth, turn the volume down on negativity and crank it up on, on your heart and, and spirit. With President Obama to deliver a message from Indian country. Did you know that whaling dates back to at least 3000 BC? Various coastal communities have long histories of sustenance whaling and harvesting beached whales. Industrial whaling emerged with organized fleets in the 17th century and continued into the first half of the 20th century. As technology increased and the demand for resources remained, catches far exceeded the sustainable limit for whale stocks. In 1986, the International Whaling Commission banned commercial whaling so that stocks might recover. In the United States, whaling is carried out by nine different indigenous Alaskan communities. The whaling program is managed by the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission, which reports to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The hunt takes around 50 bowhead whales a year from a population of about 10,500 in Alaskan waters. Conservationists fear this hunt is not sustainable, although scientists project a population growth 
of 3.2% per year. The Makah tribe in Washington state also reinstated whaling in 1999, despite protests from animal rights groups. They are currently seeking to resume whaling of the gray whale, a right recognized in the Treaty of Nia Bay. Next, Travis Novitsky is a self-taught photographer who names several photographers as influences. From the shores of Lake Superior to the canyons of Arizona and the beauty of the northwest coast, Travis captures images of the natural world around him. Clouds diffuse the sunlight on this fall day but the leaves in the north woods of Minnesota were still ablaze with the colors of autumn, something not lost to the eye of photographer Travis Nowitzki. Most of the time you come up here and the color just isn't, um, it's always a beautiful place, but we don't have the majesty that it has now with the yellows and the oranges. Um, we are right in the middle of a large stand or a large ridge of maple trees. And this is actually, I believe, part of what um, over time has been known as the sugar bush in Grand Portage. We're kind of on the edge of it here. When I'm looking for a picture or for a potential composition, I'm looking for, in a case like an area like this, I'm looking for interesting trees with neat shapes to them. Um, for the night photos, I'm looking for something that stands out against the sky, something that'll make a nice, nice foreground with the stars behind it. My biggest influence has been actually my dad, who um, over the years as I was growing up shot a lot of slide film. And winter evenings often were spent looking at slideshows, pictures he's taken. He, he took a lot of landscape shots, a lot of the kind of things that I'm doing now. Nowadays I have a lot of influences with the internet and being able to go on and just search for photographers. I've Whenever I take a trip I I search for photographers in the area where I'm going and a lot of them end up being people that I go back and look at their work and I wouldn't say compare to but just just admire. Nowitzki occasionally travels to pursue his craft of photography. Most recently he visited the west coast. The focus of it was to get out on the, along the Pacific coast, uh, Olympic National Park, the Oregon coast, down through the redwoods of California, just all along that coastal area. Being that I live on Lake Superior I'm drawn to water and I love shorelines or coastlines and the waves coming in and out. I just love that kind of stuff. But he finds that he's drawn to the scenery in his home state. I've been down in the southeast a little bit and very little in the southwest part of the state. Um, I do like that part of the state. I, I love the bluff country along the Mississippi River, uh, but my favorite is the Arrowhead and the Lake Superior shoreline, the woods. Uh, that's where most of my photography is, between Duluth and Grand Portage. Having a, a native background, Ojibwe background, um, the Ojibwe culture always has and still does have a very deep connection with nature. And I would like to think that that connection comes through in my images. I want people to look at an image and feel like they're there, so to speak. Nowitzki had his start shooting film, but switched over to the digital format in 2001 and never looked back. And while he does use computer software, he does little to manipulate the image. I am a, a child of digital or a student of digital. I, I love it. I didn't shoot film long enough to really get attached to it. If I had been born five or ten years earlier, I would have had a harder time making that transition and I would have been more stuck on film, I think. First step, obviously, is to get them onto the computer and step two is just going through and getting rid of the shots right away that I, for whatever reason, I don't like. They're, they're way too dark, way too light, out of focus. You know, you can call a number of pictures right off the bat. And then it, after that, it, it's more fine-tuning. You, you really have to examine like, for example, if I've taken three shots of the same subject and they all look good, well, i got to find the best of those three. And that's the one that I usually spend a little bit of time working on, and that's the one that will end up on the website. My 
post-processing, as you call it, is generally pretty minimal. I do some contrast adjustments. Sometimes I increase saturation. Fall colors like this, a lot of times you're actually decreasing the saturation. But that that's about it. It's basic contrast adjustments and saturation adjustments. I don't get real heavy into image editing. I enjoy that part of it, but I enjoy being out here capturing the images more, so that's what I focus on. Nature photography is clearly Nowitzki's favorite category, and there are several subjects and themes that spark his creativity. I would say my favorite subject is the night sky, whatever aspect it may be, if it's northern lights, stars, moonlight. It takes a lot more effort to do that to go out at night and set up a shot for two to three hours. One of my most common questions that I get asked is, when do you sleep? Because <laughs> sometimes I'm out shooting till three or four in the morning and then going to work at nine, but I'm constantly amazed by these images that I can manage to come away with that night. It, it just staggers me that you can take a picture at night, for example, a full moon night, and get images that look like daytime. I generally try not to make images like that, but it's just amazing that you can do that. And with digital, being able to crank the ISO setting up, do a 30 second exposure, and it looks like noon on a summer day sometimes, except for the stars that are there, but I guess it's that, that wow factor that the night nighttime shots give me that keep me doing it. In terms of a physical object, something we could touch, I would say the spirit tree is right up there, more commonly known as the witch tree. Hollow Rock is another favorite um, subject of mine. That's uh, a rock on the Lake Superior shoreline that has a hole in it. Kind of, it's almost like a natural arch. Um, those are probably my two favorite. Someday I would like to make a living at it. Um, I'm not at that level right now. Um, I do work. I have a full-time job um, apart from photography. I'd like to have my work be sort of an example of places that we need to protect, kind of being good stewards of the land, you know, I hope it has an impact that way. People look at my shots and go, wow, you know, we, we can't ignore these places, we need to protect these places. I'm not an Indian artist, I'm an artist who happens to be Indian. You know, it sounds profound, I guess, but like of everything of modern day culture, society, it's just on the surface and doesn't mean anything. How do you happen to be Indian? Just happen to be, you know? And why is it so important to make, you know, such a distinction? Again, you know, art, that's not our word, that's not our concept, it's not from our life way. Indian isn't from there. American Indian, those are all uh, epithets, if anything. I read an article about that, breaking down that word, American. You know, they attribute it to Amerigo Vespucci. But uh, I think it was Stephen Newcomb in Indian Country Today said, in Portuguese, amor is to love, uh, but that form of it is a command. Love. And rica is riches. Love riches. Love wealth. That's America. American are those that love wealth and riches. Why would we want to call ourselves American Indian when we have our own age-old name?
We continue now with part two of Barrel Whalers of the North, produced by Jeannie Green of Alaska. In part one, we watch the community help with the harvest of a bowhead whale. In part two, we learn the importance of the whale feast. Many of the people here today are from Barrow's different whaling crews or members of the captain's family. Others are residents who have chosen to take time away from their busy lives to help Henry and his crew. Regardless of their relations, each one of these people will be rewarded for their hard work with a share of muktuk and meat. It takes so much patience, hard work, and dedication to take part in the harvest of a whale that just getting the task done is reason to celebrate, and so they do. When a crew catches their first whale, it's divided amongst all the 51 whaling crews of Barrow. The whaling captain gets his portion, and then each crew in Barrow gets a portion of that whale. All those who help with the harvest get a portion of the whale, and yet another portion goes to serving the community in what is known as Nagikai. Unalik means come on over and have some fresh muktuk. That's how I learned it, and that's how they still refer to it today. Unalik Narikai is just one of the feasts they celebrate during whaling season. Another feast is known as the Eskimo picnic or Apawati. It's a tradition that we follow through and bring in the whaling boat on shore after a successful season and we put out a little feed for the community members, whoever comes down. We uh, serve them our delicacy, our mikiyak. And it, it's an uh, event that occurs during this time of the year, this time of the season after a successful hunt, the men coming back on shore. From a mile away, the crew pushes their flag-bearing umiak from the icy waters of the Chukchi Sea to the shore where they are greeted by their community. has been given, Mikiak is served to those who brave the wind and cold to be part of this joyous occasion. Hi, my name is Rebecca Brera. I'd like you to, I'd like to welcome you to Barrow. Here's the first apparati, and this is what you call Mikiak. It's muktuk and meat cut up and rendered. So, and it's very delicious. Delicious. Very delicious. Oh, yeah. So I'm serving my second round here. Oh. Second round. Yeah. Hello. 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 Thank you. Hello. 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 <laughs> this is bowhead part, the bobber, and some meat. Right here. Uh, and we call it fermented, fermented whale. Pick it up. When the muktuk and meat are harvested, much of it is placed in buckets and soaked in the blood of the whale. It is stirred two to three times a day for a week or more until the meat and muktuk have become fermented. It is considered a delicacy and is extremely popular amongst the Anubak people. He is just a guy who is eating Mickey up. He's out, active. One of these guys. He had one of these guys. He's all active. Oh, no. Yeah, I know. This Apawauti is being held in honor of Harry Brower Jr. and his crew, the little Kupak crew who have already caught the whale for the season. For Harry, it's time to retire the umiak and start getting ready for Nulakatak, the blanket toss, which is another celebration these people have during the summer. One, easy, two, 
three, go! Coming together for a feast is the way Anufak people celebrate life, a reminder to be thankful for what they have and appreciate what they have been taught by their elders about life in the frozen land. Ukbiavit. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, you can find us at nativereport.org and on Facebook. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors here on Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. Hope to see you next time. Stacy Thunder is a member of and legal counsel for the Red Lake Nation. And Tad Johnson is a member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa and is chair for the American Indian Studies Department on the campus of the University of Minnesota Duluth. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Malax Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandon Foundation. <laughs>